Welcome to PC Chess Club, Season 1, Episode 12. This is our poster of the week. For those that want it. This is our message board with the quote of the week. It is tomorrow. Counting time is not as important as making time count. And we'll try to zoom in on the little mini poster called Self Confidence. Gab. No puzzle this week, sorry. It is, it's not what you say, it's what you mean. So let's flip it over, let's take a look at it. Let's go ahead, let's see it. Now see if you can figure it out. Can you keep a secret? It's not what you say, it's what you hear. This will be our meditation of the week. <laughs> that music is loud. This one is called How to Behave, Choice, and Responsibility. <laughs> well, um, that was pretty much all of my stuff that I brought. Uh, um, you know, like I said, I'm a worship leader, so I can't play. I can't play. Uh, if, I, if I butcher it for anybody, I'm sorry. Surprisingly, this week we have one about a game of chess. It is number 147, a game of chess. When faced with difficult choices, view the situation as if... As if it were a game of chess, imagine those involved as pieces on the chessboard 
assume the role of one of the players and meditate on the current state of play. From this position, the dynamics of the situation may become clearer, enabling you to see the options open to you and to make a wiser choice. One that might make you laugh is number 148, called the snowflake. No snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. That was a quote by Voltaire, 1694 to 1778. So remember that, no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible, even though they're part of the avalanche. <laughs> I think we'll just throw in one more. Why not? What the heck? Here's number 151 called Destiny's Harvest. You may have heard this before. Destiny's harvest. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Charles Reed, 1814 to 1884. <laughs> From our book, A Thousand and One Meditations, How to Discover Peace of Mind. I don't know if you guys can see that. It does say how to discover peace of mind. Something else that we use at PC Chess Club. We use this for uh, the ones that are on semester courses for quizzes, exams, midterms, and finals. And we use it when we do Mr. homework. Mr. Breeze, are you in the house? Yeah, if you're, you're part of PC Chess Club, like it or not, you're going to have homework. But just like college and school, it has to be done so you learn something. And then you can always check back and see how well you're learning. Go ahead and show you this. Something we use, we found this a lot more handy to figure out grades. It's called a weighted easy grade finder. And here's the reason why. We'll go ahead and zoom in on that. This is your percentile weight. Like I've got one weighted for 70% of the grade. So we'll show you an example here. They've already done one for us. This is without the uh, anti-glare sheet. And this is with the anti-glare sheet. You can see a vast improvement. That would be an example, like uh, your test would be 50% of your grade, your homework would be 30%, and your classwork would be 20%. And that way you would be able to see, like um, even though they scored higher on the test, it's only weighted for 50% of the grade. Down in old Mexico, if you're ever in Alaska, stop and see my cute little Eskimo. Oh, my sweet frontline down in Berlin Town makes my heart uh, start I don't think we're going to get that one. In my China, don't, no, don't think so, guys. I could try to pull it up, try to zoom in on it. I think it's just going to come out a little blurry. Yeah, it looks like it's just going to come out blurry. Oh, my sweet front line down in Burling Town Makes my heart start to yearn And my China doll down in Old Hong Kong Waits for my return Pretty Polynesian baby over the sea I remember the night I don't know.
know if we're going to be able to get a clear one on that one. It's just that glare coming off that lens. Even with an anti-glare sheet, it's just coming up blurry. I'll try to see if we zoom in on it, if we can get anything more clear. Like right there, 70. Yeah. Would actually be a 49.00. Do something a little different. Your weighted grade would be 49. Ever. If your it's average uh, grade was 70. The Beatles' very first song they've ever did, ever. <clears throat> In spite. In spite of all the fun. Let's zoom out on that. If you this one comes in handy too. Yeah, you just put in the total number of problems and then you go by the number of problems wrong. So for those that want to be chess teachers or chess coaches, this will help you a lot. You can get these here. There's the name of it. Called the Easy Grader. The blue one is the weighted grade finder. The purple one is just the easy grader. Anything you want me to, if you'll be true to me. It looks like you can go from 1 to 34. See if we can zoom in on that. So you can put out a test for them. You can actually have them get like 34 answers wrong, and it'll tell you what the grade is. So you can go from six problems. I'll do anything for you. Anything you want me to. All the way to 95 problems. Here's an example. Here's if you had 20 problems. And I know that I've been here uh, too much way later. too long. If you had 20 problems. And I know. Two wrong would be a 90. That this is not wrong. And I'd be. That'd be an A. Two wrong would be an A, a 90. Four wrong would be an 80, a B. Six wrong would be a 70, a C. Eight wrong would be a 60, a D, but it would still be a passing grade. And then anything below that would just be an F. <laughs> but if you wanted to use it to grade chest tests, that would be a good way to do it. Another good use for this would be when you use solitaire chess in Chess Life, you could use this and you could um, see how many questions they have and then you could be able to see how many you got right and how many you got wrong and it would be like a letter grade or a number grade if you count by how many questions you got. If you were to count every question equally, otherwise just do solitaire just like they do it in the magazine. So chess many club, points. Uh, the difference between maybe say a rival chess club, Joplin chess club, when you go here, you'll be able to see how everything is more organized, very well organized. You can see all these, all the bookmarks, very well organized. And you can see here a quick summary. Rook versus knight is usually a draw. Rook versus bishop, that's on Secrets of Pawnless Endings. Rook versus bishops is usually a draw, equal. Queen versus rook is usually a win. Queen and knight versus queen is a win. Queen and bishop versus queen is usually a draw, etc., etc. We've got them all marked. And then we cross index that. Like over here, you can see over here on all of our ECE, all the Encyclopedia of Chess Endings, we have all those bookmarked as well.
Take a look at that. Is that organized or what? This is one that I'm going through right now and we're going page by page. Actually, uh, every example, there's uh, 1,610, 1,610 in the uh, first edition pawn endings. And in the second edition pawn endings, there's 1,901. So there's two, there's I believe 289, would that be? I was gonna say 291. 1610. Yes, it's close. I don't know, you guys do the math. Uh, from 1610 to 1901, you guys just do the math on that. You can see here. And that's only getting started. It's just getting started, guys. That's just, that's just a general outline. That's not even detailed yet. That's just a general outline. And here's what we got so far. Uh, going every one line by line, just up to 5C4. This one is all the new ones. The ones that are new, like in the old one, example 1400 is now gone. Section 6, C2, I don't, I don't that's gone. Do, like, it's no longer there sad. anymore. Unfortunately, I don't know much and then you go later, through here, 8A, 1522, that's gone. 1514, that's gone. But if you didn't have the first edition and you just like run out and buy the second edition, you wouldn't know that because you won't have each one to compare to. Yeah, you need both in order to do a comparison. But this is the other one. Here's the example, what you find at PC Chess Club. You can see how this is a lot more organized. Let's go ahead and pull this up, put this on a tripod. I think we're gonna do a lot better. Here's an example uh, from Ruben Fine's Basic Chess Endings. The original, you can see how we've got these marked. This one is knight versus knight, positional advantage, uh, bishop versus bishop, same color, positional advantage. Opposite color, bishop, positional advantage, bishop versus knight, positional advantage. Rook versus Rook, positional advantage. Rook, ver rook and Bishop versus Rook and Bishop, opposite color, positional advantage. Rook versus Bishop, positional advantage. Queen versus Queen, positional advantage. If you notice a common denominator in there is every one of these are marked with a positional advantage. Example. Knight versus knight. So you know we're not just making this up. Positional advantage. Thank you. So we go to here, we look up 107. Right there. Positions with even material, better pawn position, better king position, or better knight position. You can see they're all marked. Okay, I'm gonna play a little Bruce Springsteen. I think that's not same too thing here. Oop. You can actually mute this mic if you want. Get a little feedback on board. Thank you. And this 
same thing here. We put a lot of work into it for you. Like right here. I don't know if you can see that. It says underlying elements of rook endings. Underlying strategic ideas. Let's take a look at that. Some underlying strategic ideas, properties of the rook. And there it is, rook versus rook. Underlying strategic ideas are here. It's either cutting rook on the seventh rank, checking distance, or pressure from behind. We'll have that in upcoming videos. Secrets of Pawnless Endings. Here's a quick summary. Already done that. So if you just want a quick summary of what's mostly a draw and what's a win, that's it. And then any one of these we already have bookmarked. Like that one, for instance. Queen and Bishop versus a queen. And this is the words of Grandmaster John Nunn. In general, this ending is a draw. Normally black's queen can annoy white with checks or pin the bishop, and white is unable to make progress. However, in the right circumstances, the queen and bishop can form a powerful attacking force. And here's the gest of it. Over the board players should enjoy this section, according to John Nunn. There you go. That's your summary of it. So if you want to know about pawnless endings, this is probably the best book you can get. This one we got bookmarked for you called Lucina Position. And this is a rook versus rook positional advantage. Pass on the next. I don't know if you guys can see that. It does say positional advantage. I'm gonna play kind of an old Bob Dylan tune for you here. So. This is a good one here on Queens, Queen versus Queen. Queen versus Rook, and on fortress positions. Let's take a look at that. Come gather around people where now this is according to Grandmaster Yuri Averbach from the encyclopedia set, five volumes called Comprehensive Chess Endings. There you go, so you know we're not messing with you and we didn't just make that up. Fortress, Siege, and Pawn Storm. That music is so loud, it is vibrating the windows. It is super loud. Now here's something interesting. This is a table. It's like uh, what we've been talking about in previous videos called corresponding squares. Okay. But this is your theory. That is super loud. It's your theory of corresponding squares actually dealing with knight and bishop. It's not just corresponding squares dealing with pawn and king or you know, where the kings go. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of renowned in-game theoretician, Grandmaster Yuri Averbach. Says right there, and this way we can compile. I can barely hear myself think. That is super loud music. And this way, oh my God, I've never heard that music that loud. I think they've got new amplifiers or something. It is like almost a migraine. It is so loud. It is vibrating the windows. 
In this way, we can compile a table of corresponding squares. And don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. That's, damn, that's loud. That is the position right there. I'm almost screaming at the top of my lungs right now. It is so freaking loud. There's people covering their ears. It is so loud. Thank you. Thank you. Rook versus knight is equal. Yeah, believe it or not, the knight can get a draw against that rook. You might want to know that. That applies in a lot of the uh, over-the-board games. There are 28 positions. Show you right here. Right there, count the numbers, do the math. 380 to 408. There are 28, possibly 29. actually 29 here's one from an Arabic manuscript in the year 1257 hard to believe that was actually known since 1257 so for uh Going on 800 years, well over 700 years, that was known. For those that wonder about studies, this is from an international trainer, um, legendary trainer, Mark Dvoretsky. It's about improving calculation and resourcefulness in the end game. Hey, thanks, Salinger. Let's do this. This is a list of the people, you may know some of these grandmasters, that uh, do studies and it makes them a better player. Here's what it looks like if you're curious about getting the book. We'll get into who Oleg Pervikov is in a minute. That's a name you want to know. He's really good at studies. Now, if you're wondering who some of these people are, world champions that do studies. Yeah. Mikhail Tal. Some of you might not realize that he used to do studies, and so did Capablanca, and so did Alekhine, or Alekhine. Yeah, two of the greatest attacking players, Tal and Alekhine, they used to do studies, and, you know, studies and problems, and so did uh, Capablanca. Grandmaster study composers, Pal Binko, he's well known. John Nunn, there's another one. But here's one. You might have read some of his works. Aaron Nimzovich. Bet you didn't know that Nimzovich composed studies. And you might know Richard Reddy. He did studies. Yeah, there's some good studies by Richard Reddy. Here's one of the guys that was almost world champion. Some say the greatest player to never have been world champion, Paul Carries. Grandmaster Yuri Averbach. He's well known in studies, but did you know David Bronstein did studies? And here's one. There's a variation. You look it up. It's the Zaitsev variation. Well known variation in an opening. I'm not going to tell you what opening, but look it up. Zaitsev variation. 
Pal Binko, he's composed a lot of studies. And that name is actually pronounced Jan Timmen. Uh, it's a European name. You don't pronounce the J. It's it's like a Y, Jan Timmen. Here's one you didn't know, Alexei Shirov and Alexander Morovich. Morozovich. Morozovich, Akopian, and Shirov. And did you know the Polgar sisters? They did studies. Yeah. The guy that played in on for the world championship, Boris Gelfin. And that guy, Adrian Mikulchishkin. Uh, can't say, I can't talk to them, so sleep proud. Mikhail Chishin, Adrian, he was Karpov's second and Karpov's trainer. And who is Oleg Pervakov, you might ask? Who is that? Right there, Mark Dvoretsky has employed studies in his trainer's career for more than 30 years. Many grandmasters have achieved considerable success in their careers thanks to his methods. Oleg Kurbakov came to the field of composition through practical play, whose principles he has always striven to follow in his creative work. Uh, I can't seem to find anything. Oleg Kurbakov. He's well known for studies. Here's something to take note of. This is by Jan Temin, Grandmaster Temin. He said, composing an in-game study. Let me see if you guys can see that. Yeah, I think you can see it. Composing an in-game study is conducted in a different thinking environment. The composer starts with the final position that should contain hidden beauty. Then he starts thinking backwards about how the position might have arisen. This is called retrograde, retrograde analysis. In addition, in-game studies will have both scientific and artistic elements. Here's what Richard Reddy had to say about it. Richard Reddy's definition of in-game studies was in-game studies are in-game positions with extraordinary content. This, of course, is a very general definition. Take a look for a minute at uh, a couple of books that we had last time from the middle game into the end game. Some people say a man is made out of mud, a poor man's made out of muscle and blood, muscle and blood, skin and bone, you know, a mind that's weak and a back that's strong, you look 16 tons, what do you get?
just an overview or preview of what a lot of the beginner books cover and I'll try to give you the highlights. You might take a note that former world champion Mikhail Tal used to look at a lot of beginner books. Some people said that was to get ideas of how do you teach beginners when you already know so much about the game, how do you summarize it and break down just the basics for beginners? That's why it's important to know the difference in the beginner books if you're going to teach beginners. promotion down here and also about on the song. How games are drawn. Superior force should win. Principles of mobility. And then only towards the end when you're teaching beginners do you even teach anything about the opening here. Opening principles, mistakes in the opening, and correct opening strategy. But you don't really actually go into opening repertoires or anything like that, not at this level at the beginning. Here's another one. Notice here they teach in games tactics, in-game strategy, strategic 
planning. It's just the basic idea, the uh, principles of opening play. It's the development of the pieces, controlling the center, conquest of space, or, or trying to get space. Nigel Poe was pupil was Grandmaster Daniel King. Yeah, he was the coach for Grandmaster Daniel King. We should just have a good time. We can stay out all night long. Hey, now put your best dress on. Now you notice here mostly what he taught, the essentials. The essentials that he taught was uh, basic endings. Then you go down to number three, basic middle game features, pawn structures and pawn weakness, tactical complexities of the middle game. So actually three, four, and five, those chapters are middle game. The first one, basic endings, and then number six, more complex endings. There's only number two, chapter two, openings in theory and practice, but most of it is middle game and end game. I'll show you another one. This is a real good book, GM Ram. Joy for my morning and praise 
it's the middle are like three chords. It was the one time I must have cleaned out my guitar case and didn't have any sound. Thank you. 